for inviting me to be here. His invitation was short and sweet. He called and asked if I believed in free speech. I said, yes. He said, come give one. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very gratuitous for this opportunity to be with you today. And uh, uh, my daughter, Crystal, is with the ladies. And um, uh, we are uh, tag teaming this weekend. So I'm glad to be here at Park Cities. And I'll hang around a little bit afterwards and meet some of you guys. We brought a number of our books that will go into a lot of what I talk about here tonight much further than I can get to it. I'm going to try to condense oh, about 20 hours into this hour. Uh, um, talking to men, I spend a lot of time around the country on this kingdom man theme. I have the book Kingdom Man, and uh, this, this is a theme, the unifying theme of Scripture. The thing that ties all of the Bible together is one thing, the glory of God through the advancement of his kingdom. Once you remove that theme, then the Bible becomes independent stories, activities, doctrines, and theologies that do not connect. What connects them, what threads them from Genesis through Revelation is this theme of the kingdom. And I'll talk and explain that a little bit more as I go along. But when you understand that that's the theme that, that connects the scripture, both time to eternity and in history in between, then you can make sense. And so this is the message recurring around the country and through the urban alternative around the world. And so we have kingdom man, kingdom woman, kingdom marriage, raising kingdom kids. In a few months, we'll come out with kingdom singles, what it means to be a single and operating as a single under the kingdom of God. And then my latest book, which is out there as well, Kingdom Disciples, um, because everything is related to that one thing. And when you understand that, then it becomes a transforming worldview that you're operating out of and not a dissected view that many, and I would dare to take the risk and say most Christians are operating out of today. So our focus today, tonight, is on what it means to be a kingdom man, what it is all about, and, and, uh, and how does this world view affect your manhood, and how should it affect your manhood if you're going to be, if we're going to be the kind of men that God has created and called us to be. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, God says that he was looking for a man to stand in the gap so that he would not have to curse the land, but he could find none. He was looking for a man to stand in the gap so that he would not have to curse the land, but he could find none. Now, there were plenty of males in Israel. There were males everywhere. So evidently, you can be a male and not be a man. Because he said, I was looking for a man. There were plenty of males. But I couldn't find one. And because I couldn't find a man to stand in the gap, the nation was in trouble. See, if you're a messed up man and you have a family, you contribute to a messed up family. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family and your messed up family goes to church, then your messed up family is going to make its contribution to a messed up church. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, contributing to a messed up church, and your church is supposed to be the light to the neighborhood, then your messed up church is going to make its contribution to a messed up community. If you're a messed up man that has a messed up family that goes to a messed up church that uh, is now contributing to a messed up community and your community is in the city, well, now your messed up community is making its contribution to a messed up city. Yeah, if you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city, and your city's part of the county, well, now your messed up city is going to make its contribution to a messed up county. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city, that's part of a messed up county, and your county's part of the state, well, now your messed up county is going to make its contribution to a messed up state. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city that's part of a messed up county, contributing to a messed up state, and your state's in the country, well, now your messed up state is going to make its contribution to a messed up nation. If you're a messed up man contributing to a messed up family, resulting in a messed up church, causing a messed up neighborhood that resides in a messed up city that's part of a messed up county, contributing to a messed up state that resides in a messed up country, and your country's part of the world, 
Well, now your messed up country is going to make its contribution to a messed up world. So, if you want a better world composed of better countries, inhabited by better states, because they're made up of better counties, composed of better cities, inhabited by better neighborhoods, illuminated by better churches, because they're made up of better families, we've got to start by being better men. So, a man affects the well-being of society. What does it mean to be a kingdom man? Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, Exodus chapter 34, verses 23 and 24. It says three times a year, three times a year, God called all the males in Israel to come and meet with the Lord your God. Three times a year. Leave the women at home. No women allowed. Only the males to come to meet with the Lord your God three times a year. And that means all the men in Israel. Now, do you know what it's like when a nation loses all of its men being present at the same time? That's no military, no police force, normal business activities shut down, and that's risky business because there are no males at home to protect the family. And yet God says, I want all the men, all the males, to come and meet with the Lord your God. The word God in those two verses of Exodus 34, verses 23 and 24, the word God is written three times. You see G-O-D, you see capital L, capital O, capital R-D, and then you'll see capital L, small O, small R, small D. That's because there are three different names for God in those two verses. One name for God is Elohim. The other name for God is Adonai. The other name for God is is Yahweh, or as we would say today, Jehovah. Because each name for God has a different nuance to it. Elohim is God's created power name. You find that in Exodus, excuse me, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the, the heavens and the earth. That's his power name. Jehovah Yahweh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is his relational name. That's how he relates to us through his covenant. It is covenantal name. Adonai is his boss name. I'm your boss. I'm your supervisor. I'm your manager. So when he calls the men to meet with him, he uses all three names because he wants a threefold relationship. I'm the God, that is, I am the power. I am the God, that is, you're relationally connected to me. And I am the God, I tell you what to do, you don't tell me. And he says, and if I can get the males to come and meet with the Lord their God three times a year, he says, nobody will covet your land. Your nation won't be in trouble. Your family will not be in trouble. I will cover you if you come and meet with me. The reason that he called all the males to meet with them is so that he could define their manhood for them. So that when they went back to their homes, to their businesses, to their culture, they would do so under divine decree and under divine dictation. You see, a kingdom man is a male who consistently operates under the rule of God in his life comprehensively. A kingdom man is a male who comprehensively operates under the rule of God in his life. What we have done as men today in our culture and even in the church is bifurcated the definition of manhood, giving God certain segments of it rather than a kingdom presence in it, which is a comprehensive rule over it. So that everything about a male is to be defined by God if he claims relationship with God in every area of life. There is no area of life that is allowed to be excluded under the definition of kingdom. For many years, I was chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys under Tom Landry. And then I, when Jerry Jones came in, I, I took a hiatus. A number of years passed. They called me up. They asked me would I come back. I went back for a few years. During those years, my son was playing in the NFL. When he uh, retired from playing in the NFL, he came, went to Dallas Seminary, and he took my place. And my son, Jonathan, is now the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys, so don't blame me. <laughs> yeah, you can blame him, but don't blame me. When the Cowboys play or any team plays, there are three teams that take the field. Three teams. 
There is the home team, and then there is the visiting team, which means there is a clash. There's a clash. For three hours, you will watch a conflict. And nothing you say or do will change that because the nature of the game means there is a war on the field. It comes with the nature of it. Those two teams will never get along. Introduced to this conflict is a third team, the team of officials. This team, seven people, do not belong to the conflicting teams. They are easily identifiable with black and white jerseys on because they don't belong to either team. They, they, they are neutral to the conflicts on the field. See, they belong to 345 Park Avenue in New York, which is where the NFL offices are. They belong to the kingdom up there, even though they are officiating down here. Every official has been handed a book. That book gives the governing guidelines by which all decisions are to be made on the field of play. The officials must subject their personal opinions to that book. They must subject their personal uh, preferences as to which team they like versus which team they don't like. That is always irrelevant because all decisions on the field are to be made based on that book. Now, they understand that sometimes they are going to be booed because one of the teams will not like the call, and if it's against the home team, the home crowd won't like the call, and they will be booed. But that's irrelevant, too, because they're not there for a popularity contest. They're there to make decisions on the field by the book, even if you're being booed in the process. Now, sometimes they understand they will also be cheered, but they cannot even be influenced by that because their job is to represent New York in Dallas. They are to represent what they have received from up there, the kingdom of football, the National Football League, in the chaos and conflict on the field of play. A number of years ago, there was a, uh, there was a strike of the officials. They, they, they had a strike, and so substitute officials were brought in, and there was chaos on the field because they hadn't had experience with the book. And because these replacement referees were placed on the field, more chaos broke out in the NFL because you had men on the field who did not yet know how to rule by the book. To be a kingdom man means that you have been given a divine document by which all decisions are to be made in every area of your life. There is no area to be excluded if you are operating in the kingdom underneath the king. We're living in a day of the domesticated man of the neutered male. We're living in a day when men have defined themselves by their plumbing and not by their submission to divine rule. That has led to chaos in every single area of our culture. Manhood has been dumbed down. Manhood has been redefined. Relationships have been set on fire because men have wandered away from the kingdom and wandered into the culture. So then how does a kingdom man function? What does this look like? How do we redeem a cursed situation as men? There are many places we could go in the Bible, but I want to read one verse found in the book of Exodus, chapters, excuse me, the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verse 19. For I have chosen him, 
so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. I have chosen him, Genesis 18 verse 19 says, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. There are three concepts in this verse. The context of this verse is Sodom and Gomorrah. The context of this verse is a culture in decline. The context of this verse is a culture about to be destroyed. So the environment in which this verse finds itself is not a happy place. And yet God speaks to a man and he gives him three concepts that defines a kingdom man. And it is about a kingdom because he's talking to him about building a whole new civilization, as you'll see in a moment. The first thing that he says is, I have chosen you. Or to put it in everyday football language, you have been drafted. You have been drafted. I have chosen you. To be chosen in the Bible is not merely to be saved. To be chosen in the Bible means to be called to fulfill a job description. When a player is drafted, they are drafted to take a position, not merely to be on a team. If you are saved, you're on the team, but you're called to fulfill a position. So if you're on the team and not fulfilling the position, you're no good to the team. And we have a generation today of Christian men who are on the team who don't want to play ball. We not only have that, we've got a generation of Christian men who are on the team who not only don't want to play ball, but they're playing for the other side. He says, I have chosen you. You have been duly drafted by me to fulfill a post, to accomplish a task, to fulfill a job description. Unfortunately, from a kingdom perspective, we have a generation of men who do not know who they are and why they're here. Reminds me of the true story of Hank Aaron when they were having a preseason game of the Braves, Atlanta Braves with the New York Yankees. When I played baseball, I was a catcher, and one of the jobs of the catcher is to talk smack to the batter. <laughs> and so catcher's going to talk some noise. And so Hank Aaron came up to the plate, the home run king, and Yogi Berra, the catcher for the Yankees, started talking noise. You can't hit, your mama can't hit. Big man, little stick. He started talking noise. Finally, he said, Hank, the insignia on the bat is turned the wrong way. For you non-baseball people, that's the writing on the back. The writing is supposed to face the batter. If the writing is not facing the batter, then you are subject to breaking the bat or reverberating if you connect with the ball against your hands. And so the writing is supposed to face the batter. So... He says, Hank, the writing on your bat is turned the wrong way. But Hank Aaron wouldn't look at Yogi Berra. He wouldn't look at the bat. He kept looking at the pitcher. The next pitch, Hank Aaron hit it over the center field fence for a home run. Hank Aaron runs around first. He runs around second. He comes to third. Comes to home plate, touches home plate. And then he's walking to the dugout. Halfway to the dugout, he stops. He turns back to Yogi Berra and says, hey, Yogi, just thought you might want to know, I ain't come here to read. <laughs> See, when you don't know what you're here for, there are voices to distract you. When you don't know what you're here for, you will be taken offline and off task. It's like the man who said, I was dying to finish high school so that I could go to college. And I was dying to finish college so I could start my career. Then I was dying to get married so I could have kids. Then I was dying for them to become 18 so that they could leave. And I was dying to retire only to discover now I'm just dying. <laughs> I'm not really sure why I'm here. 
I have chosen you. I have called you. The first man who was called was named Adam. Adam was created before Eve. They were not created as a married couple. They were created as singles. Before there was ever a woman brought into Adam's life, there was a calling put on his life. He gave him a job. He says, I want you to take this parcel of land that I have given you, this garden, and I want you to make it productive. I want you to cultivate this. I want you to maximize its potential. Now, while you are maximizing its potential, I want you, on top of that, to guard the garden. And that is because the devil was already in the garden. Now, that's a whole theological treatise we could go into at another time, but the devil is in the garden. That's why he could tempt Eve uh, when she shows up. But, but he says, now, uh, now I, I'm going to give you a job. You are to cultivate it. You are to guard it. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to give you my instruction. From every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. The tree in the middle of the garden, don't eat it or you're going to die. Now, I'm going to give you this job and I'm going to give you this instruction before I give you a woman. There is no woman on the scene. I'm going to prepare you for the woman before there is a woman because you are going to be the responsible one. I am not going to ask Adam and Eve, where are y'all? I'm going to ask Adam, where are you? Because a kingdom man is responsible under God, watch this, even if it's not your fault. They don't fire teams, they fire coaches. Coach didn't drop the ball, the coach didn't fumble, the coach didn't miss the pass, the coach didn't miss the block. Oh yeah, but he's responsible for having the team ready to play. So a kingdom man must accept responsibility under God whether or not it's your fault. And so, Adam, I'm going to give you what you need. So what I'm trying to say to us men is that your calling precedes your sexuality because his calling preceded the creation of Eve. And that's why we must train a generation of young men in their singlehood to be kingdom men so that when a woman comes along, she comes into a man who has grabbed his calling underneath God. When God created the universe, you only see one name in Genesis chapter 1. Elohim, 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 Elohim. That's the only name you see. In chapter 2, when he creates Adam, he adds a name. The Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. It's no longer just God. Because now his power is tied to your relationship. In other words, no relationship, no Yahweh, no Elohim. The two are inextricably tied together. And so he was called to fulfill a divine assignment. He was to be aligned with God if he was going to see God work. I was in my garage not too long ago and I went to open up the garage so I could pull my car out so I could get to the office. I hit the button, nothing happened. I hit the button, nothing happened. I hit the button, nothing happened. Things were not working. I looked to make sure everything was plugged in. Everything was plugged in, but it wasn't working. I went to try to lift up the door, but it was not happening. It was too heavy. Things were not working. It wasn't because I didn't push the button. It wasn't because I didn't check the outlet. It wasn't because I didn't try to lift it. It just nothing was working. So I picked up the telephone and I called the garage guy. I said, you got to come over here because I'm stuck and nothing is working. He said, well, before I come over there, let me, will you just do me a favor? I said, yes. He said, go to the garage door. So with the cell phone, I walk over to the garage door. He said, look down to the right. I look down to the right. He said, you see that little square canister? I said, yeah. He said, look to the left. He said, you see that little square canister? He says, I say, yes. He says, tell me where they're pointing. I says, well, one is pointing over here, and the other one is pointing straight out. He said, I don't need to come over there. You just told me your problem. They are out of alignment. And because they're not out of in alignment, they're supposed to be facing each other. They're not getting the message. And because they got getting the message, nothing is working. You're asking me to come over for something 
when there is an alignment problem. See, we have a lot of men who go to church and call on God, but it ain't working. We got a lot of men who go through the activities, but it's not working. Because the issue is far too many men are out of alignment. They're not operating under kingdom rule. What they do is have a little church with Jesus sprinkled on top and wonder why it's not working. It's an alignment problem. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Jesus is under God, it says. It says every man is under Jesus. Then it says a woman is underneath the man. That's alignment. Jesus is equal to God. There's only one God composed of three co-equal persons. One in essence, distinct in personality. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. But they only make up the one God. It's like a pretzel with three holes. The first hole is not the second hole. The second hole is not the third hole. But they all tie together by the same dough. It's the Trinitarian divine nature in each member of the Trinity. But when it comes to function, they're not equal. When it comes to being, they are equal. But when it comes to function, they aren't evil, equal. When Jesus was on earth, he said, I've come to do my Father's will. I've come to please the Father. So there's inequality of function while there is perfect equality of being. Because Jesus had to be aligned underneath God for the purposes of fulfilling the kingdom purpose he was brought here to fulfill his divine assignment on earth. He had to be aligned properly. And he never left the alignment except on the cross because our sin brought him out of alignment. So he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because, son, you're now out of alignment. Every man is to be, every Christian man, he's writing to the church at Corinth, every Christian man is to be aligned underneath divine rule. A woman is to be underneath that man that's underneath divine rule. Many men complain, my wife won't submit to me. Well, one reason for that is she doesn't see us submitting to nobody. We demand she submits to us while we submit to nobody. So we're, we're getting back what we gave. No submission up here, no submission here. Because it's a, an alignment issue. The kingdom only works in alignment. That's why Adam, that's why Satan went to Eve first. That's on purpose. He went to Eve first. He skipped Adam. Because he wanted to shake up the alignment. He wanted to reverse the order. He wanted to make Eve the leader. He wanted to make Adam the passive responder so that we could reverse the roles so that all hell could break loose. God says to Adam, when sin breaks out in the universe, because you listen to your wife, now, Adam said, this woman who you gave me, I was happy as a single. You, you, I, wasn't, I wasn't looking for no woman. You didn't, you, you know, this woman who you gave me, you came up with this idea. Now, well, you ain't say that when you saw her. You said good, 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 mugger when you saw her. Now, now you want to say this woman who you gave me. He says, because you listened to your wife, because you loved her more than you loved me, all hell is broken loose. Adam, he says, where are you? That, that's his question in chapter 3. Adam, where are you? That wasn't a question about his location. That was a question about his position. He had abandoned his post. See, the first thing you need to know is that you've chosen. That's, uh, you have a destiny. You have a divine calling and responsibility to fulfill. You are to function on earth from heaven. In Super Bowl 43, with less than a minute left, 
Antonio Holmes caught the winning pass for the Pittsburgh Steelers for them to win. A few plays earlier, he dropped the pass. Ben Roethlisberger came back to him, and on the edge of the end zone, he reaches out and he catches it. That was a touchdown because two things happened at the same time. He reached high and touched low. If his feet were in bounds, but he didn't grab the ball, it's incomplete. If he grabs the ball, but his feet, two feet are not in bounds, it's incomplete. He's got to reach high and touch low. That's what a kingdom man does. He gets his instructions from way up here, but his feet are firmly planted way down here. He's not so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. He's not so earthly minded that he's no heavenly good. He gets it from there, and he's executing it down here. I've chosen you. I've chosen you to represent me in history. So the first thing is, you have to understand, you've been called to fulfill a divine assignment as a man. I have been called to fulfill a divine assignment as a man under kingdom authority. At the heart of that assignment, the second concept in this verse is to use a New Testament word, discipleship. My latest book that's in the back is called Kingdom Disciples. The missing thing in the church today and Christians today is discipleship. The replication of a kingdom worldview in the lives of people. That's what discipleship is. It is a replication of a kingdom worldview. A worldview is a lens through which you look at everything else. It's like putting on sunglasses. So everything else now is going to take on the coloring of those glasses. A worldview is putting on a perspective by which everything else is evaluated. It's called a worldview. Discipleship is designed, and this is a whole other subject, but discipleship is designed to give you a worldview. He says, I have chosen you, and here's your job. Your job is to replicate your calling in your children and in the lives of everybody under your influence. It says, I want you to command your children and your household. I'll explain that in a moment. Let me explain something, gentlemen. This is going to throw you a little curveball, but in the Bible, it is not the mother's job to raise the children. Now, that may be true in the culture, but that's not true in the Scripture. In the Scripture, it is the father's job to raise the children. Ephesians 6 says, fathers raise your children. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He never says, I am the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. That that generational line had to do with the fathers because he's the one responsible. Now you say, wait, wait a minute, I got to work, I got to do this, I got to do that. How can I raise the children? Well, God knew that you had all this other stuff, so he gave you a helpmate. The helpmate is not a replacer. It's an assister. Somebody to come along to fill in the gaps when you can't. It is the job of the father to raise the children. Forty percent of Anglo households today are fatherless. In my community, the African American community, 72% of all children are born to single parents, which means you can't even have a community when 72% of your children don't have a man in the house. You got chaos. You got more poverty. You got more crime. You got more teenage pregnancy. You got more. You got chaos. And it's rising in the Anglo community, rising in the Spanish community. It's, it's hell in the African-American community. Because the replication of men in this definition, has gone by the wayside. The way a man raised his family in the Bible, all you need is one hour a day, by the way, to raise your family. 
in terms of a consistent pattern, one hour a day, that's all you need. Because the way a man raised his family in the Bible was around the table. Because the table wasn't just for eating. The table was for leading around food. The Jewish father would come up to the table. The mother would come over here, son, daughter. Nobody sat down until the father came to the table. The father comes to the table. He pulls out the chair for the mother. The son pulls out the chair for the daughter so that the son sees what a gentleman looks like and the daughter sees what a gentleman does. It was around the table he blessed each child. It was around the table he had family devotions. It was around the table he found out if there are any behavioral problems. It's around the table he found out if there are any friends that they shouldn't be hanging out with. He did all that around the table. But men aren't at the table. I mean, there's no television, there's no iPhone, there's no iPad, there's no, no, there's no, there's nothing. Because as for me and my house, this is how we roll right now. It says he commanded his children. This is not a vote. So he commanded his children after him. So he set the pace and they were to follow. It says not only did he command his children, he says he commanded his household. In chapter 17, you find something very interesting of Genesis. Verse 25 says, And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the very same day, Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael, his son. All the men of his household who were born in the house or brought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. In other words, if you were associated with Abraham, you got cut. You got cut. In other words, he leveraged his influence over every male in which he had responsibility for. So he did his kids. And he did every male in his sphere of influence. That's because you've been called to make a difference beyond you and me and us. He says, I want you to command your children after you. One of uh, the programs that we do through the Urban Alternative and here locally and nationally is the National Church Adopt a School Initiative where we train churches how to adopt public schools. There are 190,000 public schools. There are 350,000 churches. If you get every public school adopted by a church that provides surrogate men for the boys, surrogate ladies for the girls that are at-risk students, you can impact every, every community in America without creating anything new because every community already has churches, schools, and families because we have a generation of kids who do not have proper parenting. And what should your influence do since you've been called, since I've been called? What should it do? It says you ought to train them in righteousness and justice. Hmm. Righteousness, that's kind of the vertical relationship with God. Justice is equity among men. We're in this massive political divide today. Republicans are known for their emphasis on righteousness, abortion and gay marriage and, you know, the, the moral codes of the day, and rightly so. Most African-American Christians are Democrats, have no, no major leanings toward the Republican Party because their emphasis is on justice. Equity in housing, equity in opportunity. They're on justice. So there's this great divide. The Bible doesn't know anything about that divide. It's righteousness and justice. It's vertically with God and equity among men. It's saving the life in the womb and being fair to it to the tomb. And he says, I want your influence to hit both at the same time. We have allowed an illegitimate divide in the Christian church as though God rides the backs of donkeys or elephants. 
He is the consummate independent. He only votes for himself. But we have allowed the politics of men to divide the kingdom of God. And led by men, we have not set the pace for what God has called us to be. When I walk through the old magnetometers, if I have keys in my pocket, beep, 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 kind of back up, take them out. But sometimes, when I walk through the old magnetometers, because I got a free screen, uh, I got my keys in my pocket, but the, the beep, it doesn't go off. Sometimes it goes off, sometimes it doesn't. That's because those older magnetometers had to be set. And so you, depending on who set it, they had set it more sensitive than somebody else, then it would go off if you had keys in your pocket. We got a generation of young people whose consciences don't beep because they haven't been set. Dad, Dad didn't set it. When my son Jonathan, the football player, was uh, about 11 years old, about this high, he, came, he comes over to, to me at the church and said, Dad, come here, come here, come here. I said, what? He said, come here, come here, come here. I said, okay. So I follow him. He takes me over to the church gym. I said, what? What? He said, I want to show you something. I said, what? I want you to see me dunk. I said, say what? <laughs> I want you to see me dunk. He's this high, 11 years old or so. I said, okay, let me see this. He dribbles the ball, takes it, runs, jumps, boom, dunks with two hands. Now, before you get too impressed, he had gotten a janitor to lower the rim. <laughs> so what was 10 feet is now 6 feet. I told him, well, that's nice, son, but the idea is not to lower the standard, but for you to grow up to reach the standard. The job of a kingdom man is to set the standard and grow those under his influence to meet it. We're living in a day of the dumbing down of the standard and therefore the dumbing down of manhood. No, you must be involved in replication. You must be the spiritual leader of your home. Your wife shouldn't be waking you up asking you if you are going to church today. She shouldn't be asking you to pray with the kids. She shouldn't be asking you to pray with her. You, she shouldn't be asking that question because a kingdom man is responsible. You should be the first one in your seat on Sunday to hear what the pastor has to say because he's already done the work for you. He's already studied. He's already prepared. And he has given you food to feed your family with for the rest of the week spiritually. He says, this is your responsibility. But men have abdicated the throne while still being demanding that they be respected as head of the house. And so we have a generation of boys who are growing up to be men just like their mothers. You have a calling, you have a destiny. And that destiny has to do with replication in your home and to those who are under your influence. And then he concludes by saying, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So the question is, what had he spoken about him? Well, let's back up two verses. Verse 17 says, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Now, what's that? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. What I have spoken to him is I'm going to make him a great nation. Ooh. 
Men like to conquer stuff. Okay, men like to conquer stuff. We want to build stuff. We, we, we ain't trying to get in this little fellowship circle and just have a feel good. No, we, we let the ladies do that. Give me, give, give me somebody to hit. <laughs> okay, we're going to build something. We're going to build a brand new society. That's what we're going to build. You want to build something? You concerned about which way America is going? No, we're going to build a brand new society. That's what we're going to do. We're going to build ourselves up here, something up here. That's called dominion. That goes all the way back to Adam, the dominion covenant. Fill the earth. It's a big task. Fill the earth with the presence of me. It's dominion, you know. When the Cowboys or a team gets, gets out there, they say, this is our house. Let's protect our house. We got the enemy coming in our house. They get in that circle and they making all this noise because this is our house. We rule here. That, see, that's the, the feeling of dominion. See, you don't have to, you, you, this Christianity thing for men isn't supposed to be this soft thing. You're supposed to be building something. And you're supposed to be building something big. Think about that about your business. Think about that about your career. Think about that about your money. But do you think about that about the kingdom? You're building something. The context is Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, I'm going to destroy the city. He's going to destroy it for righteous reasons or lack thereof and lack of justice. We know about the homosexuality. We know about the rape. What we don't know about is Ezekiel that says, and I destroyed Sodom because of the oppression of the poor. See, that's in the Bible, too, about this nation. You, you don't hear about that. Righteousness and justice. So I'm going to destroy the nation. Abraham steps up and says, just a minute, God. One minute. How about I go to town and find 50 righteous? If I find 50 righteous, will you save the 500,000 for the sake of the 50? God says, okay. You bring me back 50 folk like you, and I will save Dallas, Fort Worth. I'll save these two twin cities right next to each other, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, you bring me back 50 like you. He comes back talking about, what about 40? Because <laughs> he couldn't find 50. He then says, what about 30? What about 20? He finally comes, what about 10? So now the question on the floor is, why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? It wasn't destroyed just because of how bad it was. It was destroyed because the righteous couldn't be located. You couldn't find him. Interestingly enough, he had, a, he had a good Christian man in town named Lot. But Lot suffered from the disease of personal peace and affluence. He, he had been Americanized. Now, don't get me wrong. Lot, Lot was a good man. The Bible says his righteous soul was vexed at the unrighteousness in Sodom and Gomorrah. So, so he, he was a good man, but what he had done was privatized his faith. His faith was so private that when it was time to get out of Dodge, his two sons-in-laws wouldn't go with him. On their way out of town, his wife and two daughters left with him, but his wife remembered North Park. And she turned and she became a pillar of salt. Her two, his two daughters had an incestuous relationship with him. If he would have won his family, got each one of them to win one more, that was six, that would have made 12. Sodom and Gomorrah would still be on the map. See, you got to have a dominion mentality. The same way that the cowboys are are, 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 are challenged whether they succeed or not to win. You got to have that same kind of uh, orientation for the kingdom. 
for the healing of the racial divide, for the healing of the political chaos. You got to have you got to have that dominion that I'm going to build something. It says through him, I'm going to build a whole nation and I'm going to do it through this one guy. So the challenge before us is to not be satisfied merely to be males. I, and I, I love uh, I, I do this talk I do, do this talk about why I love being a man okay I like love being a man I don't like it I don't enjoy it I love it the, my first line in the book Kingdom Man back there is when a kingdom man gets out of bed the devil says oh crap he's up I just, I just, I love being a man. Let me tell you one reason why I love being a man. God told Adam, he says, uh, I'm going to bring you all the animals. For you to name them. I ain't going to name them. You name them. And whatever you name them, that will be its name. I ain't going to bring them already named. I'm going to make them available to you. You're going to name them. And whatever you come up with, you got it. See, the reason I love being a man is I get to name stuff. Now, that's not name it, claim it, because you can only name what God brings. You can't just name anything you want. He even got to name his woman because... It says, she shall be called woman. That's where you get the woman taking a man's name. It comes from that. You name her. And that was its name. I get the name stuff. You get the name stuff. We get the name stuff if we're in alignment. That's dominion. And when men abdicate their role... We wind up with Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, which says your women, your children are in rebellion and your women rule over you. And you can't blame them. You've left your post. The kingdom man, the kingdom men are males who come under divine responsibility. You know when a lion roars, when he really wants to express himself, you can hear that for five miles. When a lion roars and he really wants to belt it out and let you know I'm in the house. I'm in the house, I'm with my pride, I am, I am home now, and he belts that thing out right. He's letting you know I'm in charge here. This, 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 this is my territory. This is my house. It's time for Christian men to roar. Because we're underneath the king, in alignment with the king. Now, the problem with men is they like to give excuses. One of my books is called No More Excuses. Be the man God's called you to be. But we like to give excuses. You know, I don't feel like it. I'm tired. You know. If you're the man, you don't get to make excuses. You don't get to say, I don't feel like playing ball today. You, know, you don't get to do that. Now, God knows you can't do it all. That's why he gives you a helpmate. That's why you need to be in a fellowship of brothers. But, 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 but you, what you don't get to do is make excuses. Do you know in every football game, there's only about 17 minutes of physical contact? 
of actually people hitting each other for like 17 minutes. That 17 minutes is part of a one hour game. So you're watching it for one hour, but you're only seeing 17 minutes of actual playing. But you gotta sit for three hours <laughs> to look at one hour in order to see 17 minutes. Now if you go to the stadium, that's two hours to drive there, work through the traffic, park, walk, get your seat. So that's five hours out of which you sit three hours in order to watch one hour so you can see 17 minutes. <laughs> but now you got to get home. That's a couple more hours. You got to leave the stadium. You got to get in the car. You got to get through the traffic. So that's seven hours of which you're sitting three hours so you can see one hour so you can watch 17 minutes. Then when you get home, you're going to turn on Sports Center or NFL Network to look at clips of what you just watched. <laughs> and then the next day, you're going to be talking around the water cooler about what you just saw. But help me out. Help me out. Now help me out, because maybe I'm missing something. What have the Cowboys done for us lately? <laughs> okay. But look at the commitment to it we have. Look at the commitment to it we have. Church is too long, the game is not. We, 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 we make things happen to see the game. We, we make things happen. We rearrange things. Because that's how much it matters. Oh, tell me you can't pray with your kids, you can't pray with your wife, you can't have devotions, you can't be at the table. Don't, 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 don't. Oh, tell me you can't. For that which matters when we do for that which doesn't. Now, I know I, I've kind of been in, in your face a little bit and in my face because I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to you, and, 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 and I know, but, and I, but I also know reality. I know reality. I know there's probably some guys sitting here and saying, whoa, jeez. I feel like all this time passed by, me and my wife thinking about divorce. Um, or even if we're not talking about divorce, we know I'm not very happy, don't want to go home. Don't have that great relationship with my kids, you know. I got, you know, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't where I want it to be. Well, the good news today is God can hit a bullseye with a crooked stick. My wife's a great cook, and when uh, when the kids were growing up, she'd make these huge Sunday meals. You know, roast potatoes, green beans, cornbread, Seven Up cake, uh, iced tea. She's making these great, great meals on Sunday, but after we ate, she automatically became the Tupperware queen. Because <laughs> all the leftovers were put in Tupperware. Because she wasn't going to do this again on Monday. <laughs> all right? So she put this in the refrigerator. One Monday, she brought out the leftovers. She brought out this casserole dish. She chopped up the leftovers and sprinkled them in the casserole dish. Then she grated some cheese and sprinkled the grated cheese over the leftovers in the casserole dish. Then she got some cream of mushroom and poured the cream of mushroom over the grated cheese that was in the casserole dish. She put it in the oven, brought it out. Shucks, that was the best stuff I ever had in my life. <laughs> what it actually was was leftovers in the hands of a master. So when you give God what you have left, he knows how to chop it, dice it, pour a little cream of Holy Ghost over it, and still serve you up a life worth living. <laughs> but you got to give him what you got left, because in some uh, spectacular, spectacular, innumerable way, he can give you back the years the locusts have taken away. I love uh, I love Rocky Rocky series. The Rocky series is just great. It's a real, real man series, and of all of them, Rocky Five. That was my that was my one. Rocky Five. Love Rocky Five. 
Rocky and Rocky V is too old to fight now, too injured to fight now. He's trying to find his way. What's next in his life? And along comes a boxer named Tommy Gunn, a young, upcoming boxer. And Rocky Balboa was always his hero. So they meet each other. They get to know each other. And Tommy Gunn says, well, why don't you train me? You're my hero. Rocky says, well, yeah, you know what? That would be a great way for me to stay in the fight game. So... He trains this young upstarts and turns them into the heavyweight champion of the world. But then Tommy Gunn gets the big head. He, he's the champion there, got the girls, got the money. And he doesn't need Rocky anymore because he's made it to the top. So there's a breach in the relationship. The whole movie comes down to the last 15 minutes. In the last 15 minutes, Rocky... And his brother-in-law are in a little tavern, and Tommy Gunn comes in. And Tommy Gunn challenges Rocky to fight him. Rocky said, I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I can't fight anymore. I'm not in a position to, to fight. Well, are well, you scared? So it's a bad scene in the tavern. Rocky's brother-in-law comes over to Tommy Gunn and just tells him, you need to get out of here. Tommy Gunn clocks him and knocks him down. Rocky Balboa turns to Tommy Gunn and says, why don't you hit me like that? Tommy Gunn says, I will. Rocky tears off his shirt and, and they go at it. The fight goes outside of the tavern and it's on to the street. The, the community is showing up. The cameras are showing up. But there's a problem. Tommy Gunn is too young, too strong, and too fast for Rocky Balboa at this season of his life. And although Rocky tries his best to fight back, I can't whip this kid. Finally, Tommy Gunn reaches back and he hits Rocky and sends him to the pavement, defeated. While Rocky is on the pavement, he now remembers the first four episodes. <laughs> and what he is remembering is popping up on the screen so you can see what he's thinking. He remembers how he won the championship in Rocky 1 and Rocky 2 and how his name became a household world. He remembers that, but he can't get up. He remembers Clubber Lang in Rocky 3 and how Clubber Lang beat him for the championship, but how he fought back and won it back from Clubber Lang, but he can't get up. He remembers... Ivan Drago, the fighting machine from Russia, and how he went over to Moscow and against all odds defeated him. So the Russians were crying, Rock A, Rock A, Rock A. And he still couldn't get up. But then popping on the screen is his old coach, Mickey. And Mickey is leaning over him saying, get up. Get up. Get up, you bum, because Mickey loves you. Now, that's when the music comes on. Dun, 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 dun. Rocky shakes his head. Gets up staggering off the pavement. Tommy Gunn is walking away in confidence of what has just happened. Rocky shouts out and says, yo, Tommy, come on back. Let's go one more round. Somehow Rocky Balboa found strength he didn't have, power he didn't possess, and was able to pick himself up because he remembered somebody. 
You see, Mickey had already died in a previous episode, but while broken, he remembered this one who had died. And they gave him the power to reclaim what it looked like he lost. Gentlemen, 2,000 years ago, somebody died. But he's alive today, and he's saying to the men gathered here, get up, get up, get up, you bums, because Jesus loves you. So may God help us all become kingdom men. We'll look forward to meeting you afterwards. We've got a lot of material that will go deeper into all of this. God bless you, and thank you for having me, Pastor.